training module and some different materials that you'll be able to use to share this information uh, with different specialty crop growers. So that is really our overall hope for this project. And, and how did this project come to be? Well, uh, I certainly, all of us that are working in different aspects of pest management um, have heard in one way or another the concerns uh, about resistance management. And just in the discussion amongst ourselves, uh, we realized that there, were, there, were, there was a need for something like this. And we surveyed extension personnel in 2014, and we found that just over half of us felt marginally or not at all prepared to teach resistance management issues to our growers. So, um, you know, we, we identified this need and, uh, and we were able to be successful in getting the, the grant funds to support this. And it was really surprising to see that through the survey that 80% of the extension personnel had no formal training related to resistance management. So we're hoping that this, war that this webinar series will at least be a cogent, uh, short snapshot into the important fundamentals about resistance management. And certainly it's very important for the Northeast and all our adjoining states uh, because pests really don't recognize our state boundaries and we wanted to be able to have uh, a very unified message to present to our growers. So what, what we also found is that some of us knew a little bit about fungicides, but not so much about insecticides, or we knew about herbicides, but not about fungicides. So we wanted to offer a form where we could all bring our level of knowledge up to a certain starting point. So I imagine that some folks may be very comfortable with one discipline or another, and we hope that you'll use this webinar series to augment the areas where uh, you feel that you're not quite as strong. One of the outputs from this uh, project is going to be this core module. And basically, it's just going to be a standardized slide presentation that we are going to put together for you um, at the end of the four webinars so that you can use this as a, as a structure about which to uh, develop very specialty crop specific resistance management programs. And so in that way, we'll all start with a, with a basic background and so we can be more unified in our approach. Uh, we will be asking you to fill out some pre and post webinar surveys so we can try to document increases in knowledge. And we're hoping that a certain subset of you will, will communicate with us as far as your experiences in, in doing this outreach to your growers. So basically, here's the webinar series. We are very uh, fortunate to have some leaders in the field. We have Meg McGrath will be overview about resistance management. Then on Thursday, she'll be coming back to speak about fungicides. On Monday, well, we're going to have uh, Andre from the University of Maine speaking to us about insecticides. And on Thursday, uh, Rich Bonanno will be speaking to us about herbicide resistance. So all of these webinars, uh, except for today, will be about an hour long. We may run just a little bit longer today just because we have these introductory parts, but they will all be starting at 2.30. And so the benefits for you, I've hit on some of these. Um, you're going to get training in however many webinars you choose to participate in. There's going to be additional resource support on the Moodle platform. You're going to receive this core training module. Uh, we're going to be available. There's a team of us working on this project, and we'll be able to assist you if you need uh, once you get that core module and trying to vamp it up for your growers. We're also going to make a video that you and your growers can link to for refreshing about resistance management issues. And we also will be offering a certificate of completion. And that has three parts to it. And in order to get the certificate of completion, you're going to have to participate in at least two webinars, develop a grower training module, and, and use it in your outreach workshops, and then participate in our verification process, which is just uh, participating in the surveys and also collecting survey information from your GROW workshops, which I think is something that most of us do anyway. So that is about all I have. And um, 
as, as we mentioned at the end of this, uh, Laura will introduce us to how to move around on the Moodle and uh, all of the resources will be available there. Hillary, so, yep, it, go ahead. Um, I, I'm sorry, I forgot that we didn't uh, we didn't do the poll. Should oh, we do the poll now? Sure, or? let's let's do yeah. the poll. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to get them right into the verification process. So you go ahead and introduce that. Okay, so I'm going to start this polling. Hopefully. Um, Should be able to open these poll questions. Hmm. You may need to take the ball back. <laughs> Why are they not opening now? No, Laura, you may just need to take the ball back. Oh, oh, that's right. That's it. Got it. Yes. I think that's exactly right. Okay, so let's open these poll questions now. Yeah, and you have five minutes. There's, uh, I think there's nine questions, eight or nine questions. You have five minutes to answer them, um, and we really appreciate doing this. So just take your time. See, this is where the music would be very helpful. That's right. That's right. So people just go into that right-hand window, and they can just click yeah, on the bubbles. And they're answering beautifully. Yep. I can see that there's 17% of you that have not started this yet. <laughs> Hopefully you will start soon. So we have a few people that are finishing. Um, we have about 3% of the people that are fin finished. And that's great. And I, I I do want to prepare you folks. One of the things that um, Sarah was very complimentary on is that we had a lot of um, uh, kind of surveying and, and trying to uh, make sure that we were following and evaluating the project. So. Please bear with us. We will be asking you to do some of these types of things um, throughout the course, uh, but this is a pre and one will have a post probably after the fourth one. We'll have a few small polls in and around um, the other webinars. And Laura, will we be able to put the results up on the Moodle? Yes, we can. Okay. And I will try to do that to let people know what the information is out there. And there's two minutes of time remaining. And just so other folks know, we do have people from all across the globe even, um, but most of the attendees are from the Northeast, including Canada. And then we've got a fair amount of folks from the central part of the country and um, a smattering from California. 
I counted this morning, we had about 24 states represented, and I think uh, three Canadian provinces. And Katie is saying that there might be an issue with some of our multiple answers. So if it is buggy, if there's some problem with selecting the multiple answers, um, I might have goofed up with the way I set one or two questions. Um, Sorry, I can't really monitor your chat while this is going on because I can't see it. <laughs> I see that you're asking questions, and I apologize for not getting right back to them, but I'll try to do that as soon as this is done. So we have about 30 seconds left. could actually share some of these right now. I don't know if you want to do that, Hillary, or wait and put them on, put them in the Moodle. Well, let's let's maybe wait till the end and see how we're doing for time. And and if we have time at the end, we can share it orally. And if not, we can put it up on the Moodle. Okay. How's that? That's great. Okay. All right. So we're all set. Mm-hmm. All right. So I guess if you want to pass the ball over to Meg. And uh, I'd like to introduce Meg McGrath. She's a, an associate professor with Cornell University, and she is stationed on the Long Island uh, at the Horticultural Research and Education Center. Fungicide resistance has been a focus of her applied research and extension program to optimize the management of diseases affecting vegetable crops. She's been investigating fungicide resistance in the cucurbit powdery mildew pathogen since 1990, and we're very excited to have Meg uh, present the first in the webinars. So thank you. Thank you, Hillary. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay, or you will add a note to the chat box if you need me to speak up anymore. I think a really good place to start is defining what pesticide resistance is. It is a heritable change in the pest making it less sensitive. Um, this is going to be true for our herbicides, fungicides, um, and, and, and also fungicides, which I, I'm working with, and insecticides. So it's important to realize that the mutation can be present in the pest population before the pesticide is used. Often that is the case. So when you start using that pesticide, it's going to be selecting for these less sensitive individuals in the population. And as you continue to use the pesticide, there's going to be a shift in sensitivity as the number of resistant individuals increases. And there also can be a shift that's related to the fact that sometimes it takes a couple of changes in the pathogen or, or a pest before it reaches a high level of resistance and is, is able to completely tolerate the, the pesticide that's being used. So at that point in time, you're going to have a control failure. Products that are most at risk for developing resistance are those with single site mode of action. These are products that have um, a, a targeted activity. They're affecting often one place in a biochemical pathway in the pest. So if the pest is able to change at that targeted area, then it starts to become less sensitive to the pesticide. These pesticides tend to be narrow spectrum, but they're not all. The most important thing is that they're single site mode of action. A lot of our modern fungicides and insecticides and herbicides that we're using do have this targeted single site mode of action. So they tend to be at risk. Um, Consequently, most of the products that we're using now have some degree of risk for resistance development. And in our subsequent talks um, during this webinar series, we'll talk about how you can find out um, what products are most at risk um, within the different disciplines. Now, some of the products that are at risk do include some of our bio 
chemical pesticides and our organic pesticides, but for the most part, these products tend to have a more broad spectrum activity, um, more of a multi-site activity, and they tend to be a little less prone to resistance development. But it can still happen, and that's important to keep in mind. There's several different terms that are important to be aware of when we talk about resistance, and these do go across um, our disciplines for the most part. First, we have laboratory resistance, and this refers to resistance that develops, as you might guess in the name, under laboratory conditions. There have been um, experiments and, and research done over the years to try to get a feel for the potential for resistance to develop with a particular pesticide and for particular pests to develop resistance. So laboratory studies will be done using selection pressures. Sometimes a mutagenic agent will be used to try to induce resistance. And it's been really helpful to, to give us an idea what pesticides, what pests are most at risk for developing resistance. But one thing we've learned over the years is that sometimes the type of resistance that develops in the laboratory is different from what develops out in the field. So that's an important fact to keep in mind. So next we have what we refer to as practical or field resistance, and that's when we're actually seeing some impact on control in the field. We can have a little bit of shifts from early development resistance, uh, of resistance occurring, but not seeing an impact on control. But once we start seeing an impact on control, we, start, we refer to it as being practical or field resistance. So you might hear people talk about shifts in sensitivity or resistance when we're at an early stage and not seeing an impact on control. Next term that's important to know is cross resistance. And this occurs amongst related chemistry. So if a pest develops resistance to one pesticide that's in a chemical group, often, but not always, it will exhibit resistance to subsequently produced chemicals or other chemicals already registered that are in that, that group. And that's what we call cross resistance. On the other hand, new products that come along can be inherently more active, and so they do maintain control. And every once in a while, we'll have a new product comes along. It's in the same chemical class. It's acting on the same biochemical place in a, in a pathway in the pathogen or insect or weed. Um, but it's slightly different, and so we don't see cross-resistance. But cross-resistance tends to be the general, and it tends to be what we refer to as, as a positive cross-resistance. So pest is resistant to chemical A in um, group B, and it's, it's also going to be to you know, the next one that comes along in that group. Every once in a while, we see something called negative cross-resistance, and that's when a pest is resistant to chemical 1 in group A, but it is more sensitive to a fungicide or pesticide in another chemical class. So that's a negative cross-resistance. And that, unfortunately, has happened very rarely, but can happen. Next term to know is correlated resistance. This refers to when a pathogen or insect or weed is resistant to multiple chemistries and they're unrelated. This can happen either because the same mechanism of resistance is playing a role with this unrelated chemistry, or it's because the resistance was very common within the pest population when the next chemistry came along. So most of the individuals in the population already had resistance to the first chemical. So that's your selectable population. It's mostly already resistant to the first one. If it's going to develop, be able to develop to, uh, resistance to the next chemistry used, it's going to have resistance to both. And I've seen that a, a lot now with the main group that I've been working with, which is um, powdery mildew and cucurbits. And I'll talk about that a little bit on Thursday. There's two kind of general categories of resistance that are talked about. Quantitative and qualitative, they're kind of broad categories. So with quantitative resistance, the pest tends to be either sensitive or completely resistant to the pesticide. So what we see is a complete loss of control. It tends to be one gene that's involved, one simple change in the pathogen or insect weed that renders it completely resistant. More commonly, what we see is qualitative resistance, and the pest exhibits a range in sensitivity. 
So when this type of resistance is occurring, we'll see a gradual loss of control. Um, we can regain control by using either a higher rate or a more active pesticide or spraying more frequently. Um, but the pest needs to, get, to acquire a couple changes before it becomes completely resistant. So those are some terminology um, for you to understand when it comes to talking about resistance. So why do we need to manage resistance? Um, most important, probably, at least particularly for the grower, is to maintain effective control. If um, we're not maintaining resistance and the pathogen or other pests that we're trying to control shifts and becomes resistant, we're going to lose control, particularly if, if reliance is on a single chemistry. Um, control is going to be lost. The other thing I've seen in when I've looked at um, evaluating integrated management programs with several alternations amongst um, pesticides, sometimes I see better control, and I, I don't always accredit it to being because I'm managing resistance. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Sometimes while managing resistance, using several different products, you can end up getting better control um, regardless, not just because you're managing resistance. Another good reason for managing resistance is that it's good stewardship. Um, if you're using a product that's no longer effective because of resistance, that's really not a good um, addition to our environmental load to be using that, to say nothing of, of um, wasted financial resources for the grower. It can be argued that managing resistance, uh, particularly to our more mobile pests, is in the public good. If uh, a couple growers are just continually using one pesticide and they select for a resistant strain and that's a mobile pest that can move very easily um, in wind currents, um, as many of our, our pests can. Um, that Those growers that are not using a good resistance management program are going to affect other growers who are because they're selecting for resistance that moves on. So that's another good reason to be thinking about managing resistance. It takes a long time and it takes more and more, it's become more and more costly to develop new pesticides. We can't count on chemical companies to come up with a new product if we're not doing a good job of managing um, resistance to the pesticides we currently have. So it really behooves us to be managing resistance and not saying, oh, we burn up this chemical, chemical companies will come out with a new one. And the other thing is that we really do need multiple products in a, in a good alternation program to get control. The more products we've got, the better the alternation program, the less selection pressure with any particular one. So it really is in all of our best interest to, to use a good resistance management program, encourage the growers we work with to, so that we continue to have these products there for having a good resistance management program. It's important to realize that the major goal of resistance management is to slow or delay development of resistance. It's to preserve the efficacy of the pesticides we have. It is not to manage resistance after resistant strains have already been developed. And I think that's one of the first misconceptions that someone might have who doesn't know anything about resistance management. The assumption is, I'm managing resistance. I'm managing resistance after the strains are already there. But that is not the case. We want to delay, slow the development. That means that um, resistance management needs to start when a product is first available for use. Right from day one, you want to have a good resistance management program in place. So how are we going to manage resistance? First step is to reduce selection pressure. This is a heritable change, so if we can keep the selection pressure down for resistance developing, not select for those strains, then we will maintain the, the products being effective for a longer period of time. So how can we reduce that selection pressure? Step number one is just to limit the use of the chemical class that's at risk for developing resistance. So to do that, there's several approaches um, using a good management program. This is where IPM definitely comes into play. Use whatever practices we've, we've got that are non-chemical, be it a resistant varieties, crop rotation, um, any, any other practices that are out there that are available. And then amongst with the pesticides that we're using, 
alternate amongst the different chemical classes. And I'll spend a little bit more time on that in subsequent slides. Next for reducing selection pressure is to use um, a high or a low rate. And that depends upon the pest and the pesticide chemistry. If you've got a pesticide that's got a qualitative type of resistance, then the rate isn't going to matter. The pest is going to be either sensitive or highly resistant. But if you've got a quantitative type of resistance, then it's good to use a high rate because a high rate is going to control strains of the pathogen or other pests that have a, uh, is, are able to tolerate a very low rate of the, of the pesticide that's out there. Um, so then a high rate makes sense. So that's where it helps to, you need to understand the, the pest, to understand the pesticide chemistry. With the pest, some of our pests are, are multiplying very rapidly. That's where a high rate might make more sense. And with our insects, um, we want, and, and weeds, because they're, they are reproducing um, sexually, it helps to maintain some individuals that are sensitive. Not so true with, with our pathogens. They're multiplying mostly asexually. And I'll talk about that a little bit more um, further on in the talk. Um, so another step in managing resistance with pathogens is to focus on maintaining effective control. So the management program that you put together, you want to strive to make sure it's effective. So you're not using a pesticide in rotation that really is kind of uh, sort of effective, but not super effective. You want to have a good, strong management program. Um, but with their insects and weeds, because they do reproduce sexually, it's important to maintain some sensitive ones. And that's where refugia is an important concept with these, um, path with these pests. So there's an interesting difference to be aware of um, amongst the disciplines, um, that pathogens are reproducing asexually often, so we want to maintain effective control. It doesn't matter to maintain sensitivity in the population, but that's a different situation with insects and weeds. So amongst the pesticides that we use, um, um, within our management program for resistance, a key thing to do is to alternate with products that also have resistant risk but are in different chemical classes. So how do you know they're in different classes? Most of the time on the label, you're going to see a group number um, on your herbicides, your fungicides, and insecticides. Not always, and when we get into our, our, our talks on our particular disciplines, um, we'll provide you with some information as to where you can go if, you, if this information is not right there on the label. But most of our current fungicides and, and um, insecticides and herbicides, you will see the number right there. Um, so you know that if you're going to use this particular fungicide, you don't want to rotate with a, a fungicide that's in group 7 or in group 11, because both of these groups are part of this particular fungicide. Some big questions on management is what's better? A simple alternation, which would mean using this um, fungicide and following it immediately with a fungicide that's not in either of these groups, or to have a block where this fungicide is used twice in a row. And that's really hard to test because to test a resistance management program, we've got to have resistant individuals in the population already to be able to test. Well, by the time we figure out what's an effective program, we've already got resistance and we're on to different chemistry or a different pest to try to manage. Um, so that's some of the challenges of knowing when we've got a good resistance management program. It's entirely different from when we're evaluating our particular pesticides. We can determine what's effective and what's not effective, but determining the best management program, a lot of it is theoretical. So the thought with a simple program where you're immediately alternating to different chemistry is you're continually to uh, expose the pest to different chemistry each, each time. Um, so the selection pressure is low. But sometimes you want to maintain, and sometimes you want to maintain the selection pressure with a certain pesticide within a generation and then shift for the next generation. And that particularly comes into play with insects. Um, and that will be discussed by Andre later on. Um, the other idea is, is that if you've got a block treatment, then the pesticide rate stays at a very high level. 
So you're not going to be selecting for strains that have a, a low level. The pesticide concentration dose isn't going to drop off as quickly with a block alternation. Um, but we really don't know what is the best way. Those are kind of some theoretical ideas as to what might be the better way to go. And, and we'll get into some more specific examples with our, our upcoming talks. So we talked about alternating amongst products. The next concept in, in pesticide use is to tank mix or, or alternate with low risk products, our pro products that have contact or broad spectrum activity. This particularly comes into play with our fungicides. We have a number of, of, of things. We have chlorothalonil, we have copper, uh, mancozeb. These are products that are very low risk for resistance because they're contact materials, they're broad spectrum, um, they're, they're acting in, in multi-sites. Their major limitation is they lack the mobility of the at-risk pesticides. They're not able to move through the leaf to get to the underside of the leaf where pathogens tend to be um, most developing most, um, of, you know, that's their main area where they're, where they're developing. We really need pesticides that can get to the lower side of leaves and, and move a little bit better within plants than these contact materials. Um, and that's part of why we see much better control today than, than many years back when all we had were these contact products. We've got these materials that are able to move into the plant. Um, so it's generally preferred to tank mix these contact materials than to use them in alternation because they're not going to be able to give as good control as the at-risk ones. Um, but they have low ris risk for resistance development. They will control any strains that are already present that have resistance, at least if they, they end up being deposited in the area where these um, resistant strains are already present. Another thing to think about in, in our pesticide program is the role for our, our quote-unquote softer pesticides, our biopesticides. They can play a, an important role. It's important to realize, uh, to know what their efficacy is because we really, particularly with our, our um, fungal pathogens, we're really striving to, to achieve effective control in, as, our, uh, as an important part of managing resistance. Um, and some of these products are not quite as effective. A number of them are more contact material that gets us back into the same situation with our, our chlorothalonils and coppers and that getting these products to where the resistant strains already are can, can be challenging. But that's another potential component for a pesticide in, uh, alternation program to manage resistance. The pest biology can affect resistance, and that's, these are some important facts to be aware of while, as you're thinking of your resistance management program and thinking about how resistance develops. First is the reproduction and the life cycle or the generation time for our different um, pests. With the fungal oomycete and bacterial pathogens, the things that I deal with on a regular basis, a lot of them reproduce asexually, and they can complete a cycle pretty darn fast, um, seven days or sometimes less. That means you can get resistance developing very quickly. If the population can have a very low percentage of resistant strains, you apply the fungicide once, um, it's killing off all the sensitive strains in the population. Within one week, that pathogen goes from infecting, uh, you know, the first steps of infection to having a lesion with new spores being produced. Those spores that are then, um, with a number of these pathogens, are, are wind dispersed or water dispersed. They're going to move throughout the canopy into other, to other plants. And with a weekly cycle like that, you can very quickly go from having a very low level of resistance to a very high level and seeing a control failure if that same a fungicide is used over and over again. Insects are re reproducing sexually, so they've got longer generations. Um, it's going to take a little bit more time for resistance to build up. Um, and weeds have maybe one, maybe a couple generations per year, much slower uh, resistance development with this uh, group of pests. But they produce seeds that can survive in soil for years. So once you've selected for resistant strains, um, you may see them reappearing year after year. Ability to move long distances is another important um, 
component, uh, you know, aspect of a pest biology to be thinking about when it comes to resistance management. Some of our pathogens, insects, weeds um, can move by wind and they can move pretty long distances. Um, one of the pathogens I deal with every year, the cucurbit downy mildew pathogen, moves completely up the east coast each year. Um, that's a long distance movement and, and every year. And some of these pests are going to move on, on plants, um, another way they can move long distances. Uh, so if selection has occurred south of us um, and these pests are moving up by wind, resistance may appear in a crop right at the very start of a growing season um, for us because selection has occurred south of us. It's also important to be aware of where else the pest is occurring. Um, what other crops is it occurring in? What other hosts for our insects and, and for our pathogens? Um, sometimes it can be um, very different hosts that are being affected. Um, it can be that you can have a pathogen or insect that's occurring on ornamentals and then is getting out into our, our vegetable pests or vegetable crops. So then it's important to be aware of um, pesticides and their whole development, where have they been registered before they're registered on our vegetable crops and, and our fruit crops, you know, our, our edibles. Did they get registered first on, on ornamentals? Is the, the pest, the pathogen occurring on ornamentals? Uh, one of the ones I work with is the cucurbit powdery mildew pathogen. That also goes to verbena, which is an ornamental. So you could have selection for resistance um, occurring in the ornamental world and you get a brand new pesticide that's registered in, in vegetables and you think, ah, brand new pesticide, no selection yet. Um, not, not always the case. I know we've got some people on uh, listening in who are from Canada. You need to be aware of when pesticides have been registered in the U.S. before you because if it is a wind dispersed pest, we may have been doing some selection for you. Um, important to be, to be aware of where is the pest already in its resistance um, generation cycles. Some important facts, I think, about resistance um, for you all to be thinking about. Um, predicting resistance risk, it's not always perfect. We've had some cases where we thought we knew that resistance was a, a low risk and it turned out not to be. So for instance, with the strobilurin fungicides, this is our um, FRAC group 11 fungicides, when they first were introduced to the market, we thought they had a low re resistance risk. We weren't expecting resistance to appear very quickly, thought it would be a qu quantitative type of resistance, it would take a while, and we were very wrong about that. Resistance occurred extremely quickly. Um, glyphosate, thought that had a low risk, but with all the continual use with the glyphosate resistant um, crops that we have, we've put so much selection pressure that we've seen resistance develop where we thought we, we wouldn't see it. Um, important to keep in mind. Resistant biotypes can be less fit if there's a fitness cost to having the resistant trait, but that's not always the case, and that's particularly not always the case um, with pathogens that develop resistance. And that means that our resistant biotypes can continue to persist in the population when the pesticide is not uh, not used. And I've definitely seen that with um, some of the pests, with the cucurbit powdery mildew pathogen that I'm working with. So that's important to keep in mind. That means we can go years without using a fungicide and then go back to using it and discover that it still doesn't work because the resistant biotypes have, have stuck around. They have had no reason to be selected against. It's hard to evaluate resistance management programs before we have resistance. I've alluded to this a little bit already. That's important to keep in mind. Um, so we've got good ideas about what's going to be the best way to manage uh, our resistant pests, but we don't know that based upon having been able to evaluate it. It is difficult to detect resistance in a commercial crop. Um, more so today than several several years ago, and that's because we've got a lot of other pesticides that are now being used. When I first started looking resist at resistance um, in the cucurbit powdery mildew pathogen, we tended to have only, most years we had just one product that was available um, that had propensity for resistance to develop. So that's all the growers had to use. That's all they were using. Now they're, they're using several other products in, in the program. Um, these products, 
you know, they're alternating amongst different pesticides. The other pesticides, they're still effective. They're going to, to help mask that resistance is developed to one product. And you might not realize it's, that, that one product is, is giving control failure because others are, are, are still helping to control the pest. In a commercial field, you don't have a non-treated area typically, um, unless spray boom kind of missed a spot, to have as a comparison to know how um, poorly the control is with the pesticides that are being used. Whereas in our research fields, um, every year I, I conduct uh, fungicide evaluations with cucurbit powdery mildew where I'll look at the same fungicides in different um, treatment plots, I'll have a non-treated control. So if, if pesticides aren't, you know, fungicides I'm looking at are no longer effective um, because of resistance, I've got an untreated control for comparison. I've also got some very effective um, fungicides out there that I'm using that serve as the other benchmark to show that, okay, my application timing is good. Um, these other possible reasons for poor control are not coming into play, but not, not the case in the commercial field. And that's important to keep in mind. Resistance can be out there, and we're not aware that it's already developed. Um, not a lot of monitoring that's going on of, of resistance strains. I thought it would be valuable to, kind of, to talk a little bit about the different mechanisms of resistance and think about it more across all the di disciplines. Um, as we get into our upcoming webinars, we'll be focused more on the individuals. So an alternate, an alternate nation right at the target site where the, where the pest changes at the target site such that the pesticide cannot bind to that target site is the number one type of re mechanism of resistance for our fungal pathogens and our weeds. Can also get overexpression of the target protein um, where the pesticide is binding. And if that happens, you just got so much of that protein present um, that not all of it is, is going to be bound by the pesticide that's being used. So that's another mechanism that can happen. Um, detoxification of the pesticide. Uh, this happens a lot with insects. And what's happening is there's been a change in the metabolism in the insect, and it's able to detoxify the pesticide. And then, obviously, if the pesticide's been detoxified, then it's not going to be affecting the insect. You can have reduced uptake of the pesticide into the pest cell. Um, pesticide's got to get into the pest cell to, to be effective if, if the pest is able to, to prevent the uptake, slow the uptake, um, then clearly the pesticide is not going to have the impact. This is not a very common mechanism at this time. Um, another possible mechanism is removal or efflux of the pesticide, moving it out from the pest cell. Um, this can happen, Not also another one that's not very common. Um, this is the way that there can be multi-resistance. So in other words, we're, we're a pest um, because of the, how it is effluxing pesticides, it can have um, correlated resistance to several different types of pesticides. Um, compartmentalization or sequestration, that can happen with weeds. So in that case, the pesticide is not actually being moved out of the pest cell, but it's being compartmentalized inside of the weed um, so that, that the weed is not affected by the pesticide. And then our last mechanism is behavior, and that's only obviously going to happen with insects because they're the, our only pest that actually has the ability to behave. Um, and that, an example would be uh, moving to the underside of the leaf so it's not exposed to um, an insecticide that's being applied. The question comes up as to how genetically engineered plants and resistance, what's the role? Um, I thought it'd be worth touching on this briefly since that has been a topic that comes up. So what do we have for genetically engineered plants? Um, with the insects, we have some that produce an insecticide, um, such as the Bt toxin. Weeds um, have been developed to be tolerant to the er to herbicides. So, um, so in, in managing weeds, we've got crop plants that are tolerant to herbicides. Um, so, kind of a, a different approach to um, managing our our, our, our pests. Um, with pathogens, we don't have a, a crop plants that are producing either a, a, a fungicidal compound, um, and we don't have pe uh, those that, that can tolerate, um, that have been selected to tolerate um, fungicides. So we don't have the parallel with the insect and, and the weed world. 
Um, we do have pathogens. We do have plants um, that have been genetically engineered to resist pathogens. Um, so that that's gets us into resistant gets us into managing um, resistance in in that regard would be parallel to to managing pathogens overcoming a host plant resistance um, so different um, so that's our parallels amongst our different disciplines and well lack of parallels I guess would be more what's happening there um, as we're talking about resistance, I think it's very important to keep in mind that there are a lot of reasons for why a pesticide will fail to control um, the pest that, that it's be, it is being used for. Um, and these things are important to rule out when you're trying to determine if resistance has occurred um, in a field. Um, number one is, is pest misidentification. A lot of the pesticides that I mentioned that we're using now have very targeted activity. If um, you assume you've got pest A and you apply a chemical that is effective for pest A but you really have pest B, um, you're not going to get control. So, for instance, in my world of, of, of um, pathogens going after vegetables, if you had cucurbit powdery mildew and you thought you had downy mildew and you applied a, a fungicide targeted for downy mildew, you're going to get complete lack of control um, because there are no targeted fungicides that are effective for both downy mildew and powdery mildew. Pesticide applied at the wrong time can give you um, control failure. With insects, um, often the adults are not as sensitive to pesticide to insecticides as uh, larval stages. If a pesticide application is started once the population has gotten um, a, a large, it can be very hard to slow it down. I very much have seen that in um, trying to control pathogens, um, diseases in our vegetable crops. Once the pathogen's gotten a good hold, it can be really hard, near impossible to slow it down. So starting really early is very important. Not having the correct rate um, can certainly lead to pesticide failure. Um, this can be because the calibration was done incorrectly. So a, a grower thinks they're, they're going out um, with four, four, let's say four um, ounces to the acre, but calibrated in wrong, and he's really going out with half. Um, that rate um, might not see control. Um, it can also be a math error, just simply not calculating correctly. So it's, it's good to work through how the rate was come up with to make sure there weren't some errors that were made. Poor spray coverage, um, not getting good coverage on all of the leaf tissue, uh, missing some areas, uh, having old nozzles will, will lead to having big droplets and, and um, not getting good coverage on leaf tissue can be a problem. And with herbicides, if there's not in good incorporation into the soil, um, herbicide can't work as well. You have a chance of it not working well. Um, conditions can be so highly favorable for the pest, it is just really hard to get control, particularly if the spray interval maybe is, is extended a little bit more than it should have. So maybe you needed to be on a five to seven day spray interval. Conditions are really favorable. Lots so rain events and the intervals more at seven to ten days um, may have a highly effective pesticide, but the conditions are just too favorable to get control. Rain occurring before a product is rained fast is certainly going to wash the product, some of the product off, and that's going to affect control to some degree. If conditions are not favorable for the pesticides, some pesticides need to have, um, particularly an example, herbicides need to have some water sometimes to activate them. If you didn't have water, that's going to be a, a reason why you might see a failure with an herbicide. Um, sometimes if, if the, the crop is, is stressed, it can be not a good time to be applying a pesticide. It might not work as well, particularly with herbicides, uh, particularly with weeds. If they're stressed, they might not take up the herbicide. Uh, you can end up with antagonism among products, um, bad tank mix combinations, and this can also include adjuvants. So if you've got a product that needs to move into the crop and you've used an adjuvant that helps really stick it to the, to the leaf and not let it move in, um, you might not see as good control. It's important to be to assessing control to determine if you've got a control failure, but if you wait um, 
two, three weeks after the last application, that can be enough time for the pest population with an insect um, or pathogen to really build up, and you may no longer be seeing the control that was there um, during the, the season. So make sure you're assessing control at the proper time. Um, I kind of wanted to end up with the last topic here of talking about some of the challenges to managing resistance. It's important to be aware of these as we're developing our resistance management programs um, and, and why it can be so difficult to effectively manage resistance. Um, often we just don't have adequate tools. With some of our wind dispersed pathogens and insects, they can be um, near impossible to avoid, so crop rotation is not an effective tool. Resistant varieties are a great way to manage some of our pathogens. There may be no resistant varieties. That may not be an option of the tool. So there may be that in the toolbox, really all there is to use is pesticides. Um, no other uh, good tools to be using. Um, so here's an example with um, alternary leaf spot on cantaloupe. Um, we've got six products that we could use, um, six different fungicides, so that certainly seems like we've got a good, a fairly decent toolbox of, of, of products that have targeted activity. But if we look at the FRAC codes, we're really a lot more limited. A lot of them are FRAC code 11, there's FRAC code 3 in some of them. So if we're going to be alternating amongst chemistry, what do we have to alternate amongst? Well. Um, we actually only have two products that would be good ones to use in alternation. And this is assuming that all of these um, components are effective against this particular pathogen. Sometimes what happens um, when these products are developed that have multiple components to them, multiple different active ingredients, it's not so much to be going after particular um, pathogens with different chemistry, although sometimes that is the reason, but more it's to give these products a broader range of activity. Um, so that's something that's important to be aware of, but a lot harder to figure out just by looking at the label of a pesticide. You really need to understand pesticides a little bit better. The program might not be as effective. So you could have an alternation program using a couple different at-risk fungicides, um, and some of them just inherently might not be as effective as, as one of them. So that if you use just the one product every single week, you might end up with more effective control than if you alternated. A lot of the time I have seen just the opposite, but that is possible that that can happen. The other is that the program may be more expensive. Um, using what, the same pesticide week after, you know, same insecticide or fungicide week after week uh, may be a less expensive way to go than to alternate these other products that might be out there might be more expensive inherently to use or, you know, more, just more costly per acreage. But the other issue is that you got to have a full toolbox. You got to have several different products. Uh, for a large scale grower who's going to go through uh, several containers a season, that's not as big a deal. But if you're a small diversified grower in the Northeast, say for instance, you're looking to con control cucurbit downy mildew and you want to use all your different chemistry, um, it, here's the cost of some of those containers. It's to buy one container of each one of these products is going to cost you $1,700. If you've got just one acre of cucurbits, there's no way um, you're going to use up all of these containers in that one year. So here's all the, the number of acres that you could, would treat using each one of these products. Um, there are some other uses for these different um, products. But they tend to be narrow spectrum, um, so they're, you know, they'll be effective for other downy mildews, um, carrot cavity spot, club root. But these may not be diseases that a particular grower is going to be dealing with. Um, so big cost, um, possibly a number of containers that aren't going to get used up that season if it's a small scale diversified grower. The other thing to be aware of is that products that have resistance risk for one pest are also being used for other pests. And to give an example of that, um, here is a label for a FRAC11 fungicide um, for cucurbits, and you can see there's a 
number of different diseases that it is labeled for. We already have resistance to downy mildew, gummy stem blight, and powdery mildew, but growers might want to use it and need this product for anthracnose, or belly rot, um, plectosporium blight, another common disease in the Northeast. And when the product is being used for these, it's going to continue to maintain selection pressure on these other pathogens if they happen to be present. And that's important to keep in mind when using products for multiple um, pests. Some fungicides are also being used um, not for managing pests, but because they have some growth promotion activities. And that's also important to keep in mind. That means these fungicides may be being used when it, it isn't necessary to control some of the pathogens that are present. They're pathogens that have um, a, just not important in that particular year. That they're at a, at a low level in the in the um, in the in the crops. So they don't really need to be controlled. But the fungicide's giving some growth promotion, so it's being used for that reason those pathogens are going to be under selection pressure to develop resistance to those fungicides. Um, important to keep in mind when they're being used for that reason. Um, I kind of like to end with some key points about managing resistance that I've talked about today. Um, realizing that most of our modern pesticides have some risk, uh, risk of resistance developing. Um, we'll go over that um, with our subsequent webinars that are coming out, but um, really long list of, of pesticides that are on the market today that have some risk of resistance developing. Very small list of what is has a low risk. Remembering that our that why what we're doing when we're trying to, to manage resistance is to manage those pest biotypes before they've been detect, detected, before we've dis, started to um, detect problems with control. So you always want to be implementing um, a resistance management program. You always want to strive with growers for them to realize that um, they're not waiting until they've got resistance to manage it. They're managing it before resistance is detected, before it's there. Using an integrated management program is um, key to managing resistance. Use all the tools that are available in the toolbox. Minimize the use of, of those at-risk um, products. And then recognize the challenges that I've talked about um, to managing resistance and the challenges of dealing resistance. I think those are also very important. And that's what I wanted to cover today. Um, hope that made sense. And um, if we've got time, we can answer some questions. Meg, there are a couple of questions here. Can you hear me? I sure can. Okay. Um, got a question about uh, if you could summarize when to use simple versus block, or, or is an advantage of one versus the other not known except that you don't want to bl want a block to last across generations? We really don't know when is the best time, and it and it is more um, discipline related. Um, so it makes sense to to use a block when you're talking about an insect pest and using a block within one generation and then shift to different chemistry with the next generation. Um, with fungal pathogens, we really don't know what's the better way, way to go. What, is it better to maintain that selection pressure and at a high level, particularly if we think it's um, a more of a, a quantitative type resistance, or is it better to keep throwing different chemistry at the pest? Um, the other we really didn't talk about is, is um, having combination products. Is it better to have several products together um, in a tank mix versus alternating? Um, a lot of things we don't know. Okay, and that might kind of segue into this other question. Um, it, it, there's a question about, is there a list of pesticide-pest combinations showing which combinations are quantitative versus qualitative resistance? Oh, um, it, we know that once resistance is developed. Um, so once resistance is developed, we generally can figure out what, what that is. Um, but until we do, we do, there are lists, and I will be going over that um, in my talk on, on Thursday, of where you can find information about what pests have higher risk and what, pesticide, what fungicides have higher risk. Hillary, did anybody um, chat directly to you? I don't see any on the general, any other questions on the general chat. 
And if anybody else has any questions, they could actually, um, if we were orderly about it, I'd, if there's just a couple of questions, you could actually unmute yourself and ask Meg. That sometimes is the easiest way to do it. If you want to try that, or you can type it into the chat box if anybody's got questions. It's Crystal. I'll be brave. Good, Crystal. Thank you. <laughs> so, Meg, I had never thought about the idea that as growers um, transition products, you know, we develop resistance to a certain disease, and they then transition that product use to another disease that we're still selecting for resistance in the first disease. Um, and, and I tend to recommend to growers to keep using a product if there are diseases that it's still effective for. Should we not be doing that? Should we be telling people if there's a real problem with resistance in an important disease, even if that product is effective, um, stop using it for other diseases? That's a hard thing to do because we don't have a lot of choices. Um, I, you know, I tried to show that with that alternate area example. Um, one thing that I will do is, is suggest that you use the product at a time where the resistant pathogen isn't present. Um, so one example I'll talk about on, on Thursday is with Phytophthora blight. Um, we have pesticides that are, fungicides that are effective for Phytophthora blight and for cucurbit downy mildew, and we've got some products that are no longer effective for cucurbit downy mildew because of resistance. So I recommend growers use those products that aren't effective anymore for cucurbit downy mildew early in the season when only Phytophthora blight is, is a concern. Um, and, and so be thinking about how you use your products in that regard. And there, there may be situations where we just can't avoid using a product on a resistant strain because we are trying to control another pathogen, um, but realizing um, what's happening. Does anybody else have any questions? I'm not, oh, we, I do have a couple of other questions here that are in the chat box. I don't know if you can see them, um, Meg. But hold on, let me see if I can read them to you. Oh dear, we have a lot. Okay. Um, are there protocols for resistance assays that can be used to test field resistance? There is apparently a turf, um, a turf grass uh, website a service that can do that at UMass. Is there anything any, anywhere else? It, it, there, there are some, some bioassays that can be done if we know what the resistance um, gene is. Um, there's been efforts to, to develop tools for detecting that um, within the pathogen population. Um, not widespread, not, not a lot of tools out there at this, this point in time. Um, Okay, and then we had another question about the same exact thing about trying to find resources that um, discuss qualitative versus quantitative resistance, and maybe we'll try to have some kind of explanation about that. Or, or yeah, until resistance kind of develops, we really don't know. Um, yeah. We can kind of guess. Um, then we have a question about um, the slide on reducing selection pressure for resistance. Meg said for qualitative rate, doesn't matter for quantitative use a high rate, should it be the opposite? Because quantitative is either yes or no, the rate doesn't matter. With quantitative, maybe I misspoke. With quantitative, the rate's not going to matter. Whatever okay. rate you use, you're going to select for the resistance strain. With qualitative, there may be strains in the population that have a very low level of insensitivity. So if you use a low rate, those strains may be able to survive. But if you use a high rate, you're going to wipe, you're going to control them. Okay, so we'll check and that slide because somebody said that the definition. Might, I did not catch that either, but I was doing some chatting. So apparently on one of the slides it might have been turned around. So I'll just have to check that. And I might have mis misspoke. In which case, you better correct it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the terms are too similar. Yeah, that's right. We have another question. Um, how are softer fungicides able to be rotated and maintain resistance management when they are not actually killing off the resistance pathogens? 
Well, it depends on the product. I mean, some of them are effective and are killing off the pathogen. Some of the issue, or, or, or insects, some of the issue is going to be that they don't have the mobility in the plant that our at-risk products have. So a number of our at-risk products can move through the leaf to the underside of the leaf. And just like our multi-site contact um, fungicides like copper that can't move through the leaf, some of these biopesticides are the same way. They can't move through the leaf. So whatever can be done to help improve um, um, coverage on the leaf is, is going to help to, to get better control with some of these products if, if that's the issue, if it's strictly coverage. And some of our, 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 our softer our biopesticides inherently are not as effective um, as our, our conventional fungicides and other pesticides. So that's the other issue. Um, all right, and um, I think we're going to make sure, Hillary has a note there that we'll make sure to uh, confirm the qualitative quantitative thing and make sure that that's correct on the Moodle before we post the um, PowerPoint. I think this might be the one last question. Um, the concepts of resistance and resistance management seem to get complicated and murky and contradictory, contradictory if looked at across all types of pests. Do these concepts get any simpler if looked at just with pathogens, just with insects, just with weeds? Uh, they, uh, they absolutely do become a, a bit easier. I mean, it still is a complicated subject. Um, and I think it's important to have this one overview as we start to realize that there are differences. So that if you understand managing insect resistance and you understand about refusion, you've heard about that, to realize that's not a concept that comes over into into the um, fungicide resistance management world, to realize that, that, that it doesn't apply to pathogens, um, but that there are some basic similarities. You know, the goal of, of resistance management, not, not waiting until you have resistance to start managing resistance, um, to, to alternate amongst products so that you're using your at-risk products to, to the minimal that you can. Um, Hopefully that helps. It is a complicated subject. Yeah, so um, does anybody else have any questions? Are we, I mean, I, I think that was a nice segue into the fact that we do have another um, three webinars that will drill down to the different uh, subject matters. And we were going to try to do a little, um, one last little poll. And Hillary, I don't know if you can turn your, I'm going to take your little, presenter ball and give it back to me, Meg. Uh, 